thank you everybody for uh, for joining. Um, today is World Quantum Day. So uh, in celebration, we're happy to be able um, to have uh, some, some of our collaborators from um, Virginia Tech who helped create um, one of the Physics Quest activities for the 2021 kits um, on uh, quantum circuits. <laughs> Uh, so they're going to be telling you all about um, about the the game they developed, the concepts behind it, uh, and and help answer your questions about implementing it in 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 your classrooms. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Ed, um, and then and then uh, we'll be monitoring the chat if you have questions. So feel free to put something there or to use the raise your hand feature um, on Zoom, and we'll be sure to get to your questions. Great, thanks, Ali. And um, <clears throat> as Ali said, you know, <clears throat> please feel free to interrupt during any part of this. I'm happy to answer questions. <clears throat> so, before describing this uh, quantum circuits activity um, that we developed in in collaboration with Physics Quest, I wanted to give you a bit of background about what this is about. And this is related to something called quantum information science, which is currently a very big endeavor uh, spanning a broad swath of science, which is basically about trying to use quantum mechanics to develop new kinds of technologies. So just to give you a quick uh, understanding of quantum mechanics, uh, so classical physics is the way that we understood things uh, up to about 100 years ago. And you know, a long uh, history led to the understanding that uh, everything in the universe is made up of particles. And there was this idea in classical physics that if you can understand where all the particles were and what direction they were moving in at some snapshot in time, then you can predict exactly where they would all be at some future time. And so in this sense, people thought the universe was deterministic. But all of that started to change in the beginning of the 20th century when people started to do more sophisticated experiments. And in the span of a couple of decades, people went from thinking everything is deterministic to deciding that nature is fundamentally probabilistic. So it's a drastic reformulation of our understanding of the microscopic world. And so to give you a sense of what happened, I thought I would share a, a really nice video on YouTube, which explains, I would say, the key experiment that led to the development of quantum mechanics. It's about a six minute video. It's a, it's a little bit of a hokey cartoon character, not in the Virginia Tech sense, but hokey in the, the usual sense. Um, but I think he explains the experiment very well. Please let me know if the sound is not very good. Here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slip experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slip and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. If 
happy days, just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marble, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. Physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. It was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Uh, okay, there's one question in the chat. Will the recording be made available later? Yeah, we can provide that for sure. Um, yeah, so are there any questions at this point about the video? So the video stops sort of at the kind of crucial point um, leading to the idea that everything is probabilistic. So this is real data from that experiment that the video was describing. So this is collecting electrons on the, on the screen, essentially one at a time. And you can see this uh, first panel here is at an early time and only a few electrons have been collected and they seem to land in a random pattern on, on the back screen. And then as you wait longer and longer, you collect more electrons. And initially it seems like they're just landing randomly. But if you wait long enough, eventually you start to see these bands emerge, indicating that there are certain points on the screen that are more likely for the electron to impact and there are also these dark regions where the electron is less likely to go. And what this is showing is that the location of the electron is random. There's some intrinsic probability to it. And until you measure it, you're not sure where it's going to land. But the wave-like nature of the electron uh, is related to the fact that it's probabilistic. The wave tells us something about where it's most likely to be found versus where it's less likely to be found. So this experiment really led to this revolutionary concept that uh, developed into quantum mechanics. And so the, this uh, quantum circuits game is about exploring this concept essentially. And so how do we interpret this? So the electron or any other particle um, in nature does not have a definite location until we measure it. And until we measure it, it's described by some wave of probability. And to simplify things, we can, we can describe that wave using this mist like shape. 
And let's, for simplicity, just suppose that the electron can be in one of two possible locations. It can be either on the left side of the screen, for example, or the right side. And so we'll just only focus on the case of two possibilities to keep things simple. Um, and so before the electron is measured, we could describe its, its uh, state using this, this sort of picture. So it's in some combination of both left and right until we do the measurement. And we call this combination a superposition. And so we already have technologies that know about quantum mechanics and rely on quantum mechanics that we use in everyday life. Things like lasers and transistors, you know, any uh, GPS device, various types of medical equipment, anything related to magnetism, all of these things rely on quantum mechanics. So it's not just a, a theory, it's something that's been realized in all kinds of uh, everyday technologies. But uh, what this exercise is about is quantum information science, which is a bit uh, going beyond these, these more um, everyday type applications. What we want to use is the, these principles of quantum mechanics like superposition to make new types of technologies, new kinds of computers that are fundamentally different from the ones that we currently have, new types of communication networks going beyond the type of internet that we have at the moment, and also new types of um, scientific instruments. And so these uh, basic um, types of technologies that people are envisioning right now form what are considered the four pillars of quantum information science, quantum computing, communication, sensing, and simulation. And this has become a huge industry in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, it's an in interesting field in the sense that it's very interdisciplinary. So although quantum mechanics originated in physics, um, this idea of quantum information science has expanded into many other areas like computer science, different kinds of engineering, chemistry, math. And realizing these technologies really requires people from all these different disciplines to come together and figure out how to solve really hard problems. So it's, a, it's rather unique in that sense. And I said it's become a huge um, industry. So in the last few years, we've had major investments from the federal government in the US. And this is following many other similar investments in other countries around the world. So back in 2020, um, the United States government established what's called the National Quantum Initiative Act, which uh, is well in excess of $1 billion. And this is an investment that uh, partially led to the creation of new quantum centers around the country, led by either the Department of Energy or the National Science Foundation. Um, and then there, there's also a lot more funding for you know, basic science and quantum information you know, all around. And a big part of this is um, boosting um, quantum information education. Right now, you know, there's a lot of money going into international labs, universities, and, and companies, as I'll mention in a second. But there's a, a severe shortage of workforce in people, you know, trained in these areas. And so part of the reason why, you know, us from Virginia Tech are, are collaborating with PhysicsQuest and other partners like this is to try to to get around this problem, to get more people trained in this area. And so yeah, here's a snapshot of all the companies that have major investments in quantum information. IBM, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Intel, all of these companies have invested uh, upwards of a billion dollars at this point um, developing these technologies. And there are various career directions that one can pursue, ranging from industry and startup companies to academia, national governments, and uh, national labs and the government. Okay, so let's talk a bit about how this um, activity works. So the basic idea in quantum information science is to revolutionize the way that we compute things. So in ordinary computers, the basic uh, bits of information are described you know, as bits. And so you have little bits of circuit that can have two, one of two possible configurations and we interpret these as either zero or one or true or false. And then all the data in the computer is built up out of strings of zeros and ones. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a pictorial representation of, of the way these bits uh, work. So instead of writing true or one, we're gonna use a, a black shape like a circle. And instead of talking about false or zero, we're gonna use a, a white shape. And then we can use different kinds of shapes to distinguish different bits. So for example, if we have two bits in our computer, then we would use two different shapes like a circle and a square. And so the circle could be black and white. And similarly, the square can be black and white representing all the possible values of these two bits. So computers are based on bits 
and bits operate according to binary logic. Instead of talking about decimal numbers, we talk about numbers that are written only as combinations of zeros and ones. And so any decimal number like 239, for example, can be broken up into a binary representation. And basically we just need to count. Um, so in, the, in the, the decimal system, of course, we count the numbers of hundreds, the numbers of tens, the numbers of ones that make up the number. And that's how we decide to write down 239 as the sequence 239. But we could do the same thing for any other basis. And binary, for example, looks like this. So here we write the number as a, a string of zeros and ones. And when and each digit again is just counting powers of the base, but here the base is two instead of 10. And so the first digit counts the number of fours that make up the number, and this counts the number of twos, the second digit, and so on. And the rightmost one counts the numbers of ones. And so this number, um, if you add it up, it has one four comprising it and one one. So this is how we represent the number five. But now in our pictorial notation, we're going to, as I said, instead of using ones and zeros, we're going to use these colored shapes. And so we would write this as a black circle, a white square, and a black triangle. Now, the way computers work is they start from some sequence of zeros and ones, and then they do operations on the sequence to get a new sequence of zeros and ones. And that new sequence that we get has the, the answer that we were looking for. So whatever program that we're trying to run, the, the answer is encoded as zeros and ones. And so the, the basic operations we can perform on these bits uh, are things like an AND gate. And so to describe each of these operations, we write down a truth table. So for example, there's a common one is the AND gate, which evaluates to true if both inputs are true. So in terms of bit values, if the two input bits are zero, then the output is zero. If the two inputs are zero, one, the output is zero. And only if the two inputs are both one is the output equal to one. So if true and true, then the result is true. And then there are other basic gates that are used very often in classical logic, like the exclusive OR gate or the NOT gate. The NOT gate is also important for us. Um, so the basic um, operation here is that we start, if we start from a zero, we flip that to a one. And if we start from a one, we flip that to a zero. It's, so it just does the opposite of whatever the input is. And in terms of our pictorial formalism, if we input a white shape, then it becomes black and vice versa. Now, another important class of gates are ones that act on uh, two bits coming in. Uh, and so the AND gate and the exclusive OR gate are examples of this. Um, and another important one is called the control NOT gate. So this one flips the value of one bit depending on the, the value of, the, of another. And so for example here, um, I'm only going to flip the second bit if the first bit is one. And so in these first two cases here, the first bit is zero, so I'm not going to do anything. So the output is the same as the input. But if the first bit is one, then I'm going to flip the second bit. So the input one zero becomes one one, and the input one one becomes one zero. So these two gates, the knot and the control knot are going to be very important for our quantum circuits activity. And we'll see them in more detail going forward. So here's what these gates look like in our pictorial representation. So just as we replace bit value zero and one by shapes, we're going to describe these uh, gates, logical gate operations as boxes. And so the idea here is that, for example, here's the NOT gate that I just showed you in the previous slide. So if we input a shape of one color, say white, then the output is black. And if we input black, then the output is white. So you can imagine that we're just passing the shape into the box. The box does whatever is indicated on the outside here. This is the symbol for the NOT gate. And it just uh, switches the color. Now, of course, if we apply two NOT gates in a row, then the input and output are always going to match because we're just going to undo the flipping that we did from the first gate. So the second gate just undoes the first one. So and when this happens, we say that the NOT is its own inverse. Um, so if we input white into two knots in sequence, we get a white out. If we input black, we get a black out. Now there are other important gates. Um, another one that will be important for our activity is the swap gate. This is a, a two-bit gate. So it takes in two bits, it produces two output bits. And all it does is what its name suggests, which is to swap the colors of the two inputs. So if the two inputs have the same color, then nothing happens. 
So white, white goes to white, white. But if I have white, black in the input, then the output is black, white. So I'm just swapping the colors. And if the input is black, white, the output is going to be white, black. And of course, nothing happens if the input is both uh, black, black. Okay, and now here's the controlled not gate again that I showed you earlier. Previously, I showed you the truth table in terms of zeros and ones, but here's what it looks like in this pictorial formalism. So now the C not gate is described by this two bit box. And the symbol here is a similar symbol to what we had for the not gate, except now there's a bar and a dot as well. And what this is meant to show is the side that has the, the target symbol here is the one that gets flipped, but that depends on the color of the controlled one, which is on the right in this case. So this uh, smaller dot is the, on the side where we test and see what is the color of this one. If it's black, then we perform the not operation on the left guy. And so here, both of the inputs are white in this case. And so this not gate is not activated. And so the output is the same as the input. But in the second example here where the the black input bit is, uh, so the, the right input bit is black. Now the not gate becomes activated and it switches the color of the left input. And so the white goes to black. And then here in the third case, I have an, a white input on the control. And so nothing happens to the bit on the left. And again, here, if the input bit on the right is black, then I activate the not gate and it switches the color of the left bit. So these are the, the basic gates that are important for the, the circuit uh, activity. Um, here's a, in order to kind of do a warm up for that uh, card game that we've developed, I think it's helpful to have students work through a couple of basic exercises using pen and paper. Uh, so here's a, a simple exercise where we can stack a bunch of these boxes together. So, you know, to do a more complicated computation, essentially what a computer does is it takes a bunch of these boxes and stacks them in a certain way. And the way it stacks them, which boxes it uses, it depends on what algorithm you want to run. But then once you've collect, made a collection of, of boxes this way, now you have fixed an algorithm. So for example, you can input a, some number in, in the form of a bit string and do say an addition algorithm where you just add up all the bits. There's some collection of boxes that does that. And the collection of boxes is called a circuit, which is why we call this game quantum circuits. So in this example here, I have four bits being input into this collection of single and two qubit gates. And in order to figure out what the output is in this case, we can basically just uh, break it up layer by layer. And so first we can ask, what is the output from the first two boxes in the top? And here on the left, I have a swap. And so that's going to switch the colors of the two inputs. So I'm going to have black, white on the left. And in the second pair of qubits, uh, pair of bits, I have a C not gate. And so since the rightmost bit here is black, it's going to activate the knot and it's going to switch the triangle from black to white. And so this is what the output is in this intermediate layer of this circuit. And now to keep going, I can now just take this as my new input into the second layer of, of gates. And I can see on the left, I have a not gate. So that's going to change the black to a white. In the middle here, I have another C not gate but uh, the input bits here are both white, so nothing is activated. And so the output is going to be white, white. And in the last case here, I input a black into a not gate and that's going to give me a white diamond. And so the output should be all white. So you can systematically break up the circuit and analyze it layer by layer to figure out what the final output is. And so, as I said, you, you can do useful things by choosing boxes. The right types of boxes in the right order can perform useful uh, operations. So for example, if you want to make a, a box that adds numbers together, you can do that by combining a box called copy that just takes an input and produces two outputs that are the same as the input. So like a copying machine and combined with an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate, this uh, creates a a circuit that basically adds two bits together. But these kinds of gates, ones that have a different number of inputs and outputs are never realized in a quantum machine because in quantum mechanics, the only gates that are allowed are ones that have the same number of inputs and outputs. And these are called reversible gates. Meaning that if you know what the input is, you can find the output, but then you can flip it around and say, if I now take the output as the input, um, I'm just going to get back what the input was. Meaning I can just run the gate in reverse. Um, and that only makes sense if I have the number of if I have the same number of inputs and outputs. 
Okay, so everything I've said so far in terms of um, these shapes and boxes could describe both classical computers and quantum computers. What's different for quantum computers is that we can have superpositions like we saw for the double slit experiment video. Um, and so, as I said, we're going to represent superpositions using this mist here, where this indicates I have two possibilities, either white or black. And I don't know which one I'm going to get until I do a measurement. And the measurement outcome is going to be random. 50% of the time I'll get white, 50% of the time I get black. But quantum computers are designed to be able to process superpositions like this. And that's the key feature that they have. And so an important ingredient in quantum computers is a, de is a device that produces a mist from something that's originally not a mist. And this box is called the Hadamard gate. So it takes in a white shape and produces a superposition of white and black. And if you feed in a black shape, it produces again a superposition, but this one is a little bit different from the one that's obtained from inputting a white. Uh, and we indicate that difference using a minus sign here. And we'll see in a little bit how we can use, how we manipulate this minus sign to do different calculations. Um, so maybe I should pause here for a second in case there are questions at this point. Feel free to unmute and ask your question or put it in the chat and we can help voice that. Okay, so as I said, measurements destroy superpositions and this is essentially an experimental result. This is something that we saw in, the, in this double slit experiment that the video described that uh, this mist is, is describing a wave of probability, which you know, is indicating that we're not sure what uh, result we're going to get for the measurement. But when we do the measurement, when we observe what the object is doing, like if it's a small particle, then we always get one answer. It's either white or black whenever we look at it. And it's this um, behavior of measurement that brings in this probabilistic aspect of quantum mechanics. It's only at this point when we do the measurement that things become probabilistic. So then if we take a Hadamard box, like we had before, we know that if we input white shapes, we get this equal superposition of white and black. But then if we immediately follow that with a measurement that collapses the state and produces randomly either white or black each time with 50% probability for each. And so this is what we would see in the output for a circuit like this that has a Hadamard followed by a measurement. And similarly, if we input black into the Hadamard box, we again get a superposition as we saw with the, the extra minus sign. But if we do a measurement, again, it collapses the state and every time we get either white or black. And so these are the sorts of outputs we would see after we do measurements. So if every time we try to measure a superposition, we destroy the, the mist, how do we know that there is a mist in the first place? Um, for example, perhaps the Hadamard box is, is you know, made up of a box like this that has some little guy inside holding a knot gate and he flips a coin. So every time the input comes in, he just randomly decides whether or not to apply the knot gate. And so randomly the output will be either white or black. So is this really what's going on? Is this, um, kind of the origin of all this mysteriousness in these sorts of experiments. Um, we can prove that this is not the case because if we stack two of these Hadamard boxes on top of each other, now, if, if it was the case that there is um, you know, a guy inside just randomly flipping the color, then it wouldn't matter how many Hadamard boxes we stack on top of each other, the output here would still be randomly black or white. But experimentally, what we find is that that's not what happens. What happens is that the output color down here is always the same as whatever the input color was. So by stacking two of these Hadamards together, somehow the randomness goes away. And so this shows that there's something much more subtle and interesting happening um, in these kinds of experiments. So this is not the situation. There is not a, a little person inside there flipping the coin. Uh, something is much more, uh, something much more interesting is going on. But of course, as the video was describing, if you try to observe 
what the particle is doing. For example, in the double slit experiment, if you try to see, is it going through the left slit or the right slit, then you sort of destroy all the magic. And here, this is equivalent to measuring what the state of the, of the, of the qubit is halfway through between these two Hadamards. And if we do that, the randomness gets restored because we're collapsing the state in, in the middle here. And so the output is again, randomly white or black. And so the, this quantum magic is only, only survived so long as you're not observing uh, what, it, what the state of the system is doing. Now I showed equal superpositions where I had a single white and a single black, um, meaning that I have a 50-50 chance of getting either color in a measurement. I can also have unequal superpositions. For example, I could have one white and three black, and this changes the balance so that when I do a measurement, in this case, 10% of the time I get white and 90% of the time I get black. Um, and then similarly, I can also write down mists of more than one qubit. So here's a two qubit mist. I know it's two qubits because I have two different shapes, circle and square. And again, if I do a measurement of these two qubits, I will randomly get either of the two configurations shown inside the mist. Um, let me not worry about partial measurements here. Um, so there are a number of rules that we've included in the packet that explain how you manipulate these mists. Um, I'm just going to quickly show them, but you can look at them more carefully later on. So one thing is that the order in which these different configurations occur inside the mist doesn't matter. So here I have white, 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 black. I could easily just rearrange that if I want to, and nothing's changing. It's the same state. Now, here's where the minus sign becomes important here in the second rule. If I have two entries that are the same except for a minus sign, then I can cancel them out. And so here I had white, black, minus black. The black and the minus black will cancel, leaving me with only a white. And if I have only a single entry inside the mist, it's not really a mist because I know for sure what the outcome is going to be if I do a measurement, because there's only one possibility. So I can remove the mist if I just have a single entry. And uh, another rule that's important here, for example, is how to combine or factorize mists of more than one qubit. So for example, here I have a two qubit mist with a white circle, white square in the first entry, white circle, black square in the second entry. Because I have a white circle in every entry inside the mist, I can factor it out. It's very analogous to uh, what we see in algebra when we have a, an expression like this, AB plus AC, we can factor out the A and write it as A times B plus C. It's, it's uh, very similar to that. And then also analogously to how we manipulate things in algebra, we can combine mists. Um, so for example, here's a mist of one qubit, the circle qubit, times another mist of a square qubit here. And I can write this as a two qubit mist, basically just by combining each entry from the one with each entry of the other, and just listing all of the possible results inside this mist. So here I can combine the white circle with the white square to get the first entry. I can take the white circle with the minus black square. Um, that's the second entry here, and so on. And so this is just like multiplying two expressions like this in uh, algebra using the so-called FOIL method, where you just multiply the, the inners and the outers uh, sequentially. Now we can measure only one qubit in a two qubit mist. So here's a, a randomly chosen two qubit mist with three different entries. And I can choose to measure only the square qubit, for example. So I put the measurement box on the right to indicate that. And now when I do that, I'm going to, when I, when I do the measurement of the square, I will either get white or black randomly. And in this particular example, I have two whites and one black, which means that two thirds of the time I'll get white and one third of the time I'll get black for the square. But when I do that measurement, the resulting state is going to be whatever, I just keep all of the entries that are consistent with the measurement outcome. So if I measure the white square, then I will keep the first two entries in my final state as shown here. But if I measure the black square, then I'll just keep this last entry because only this one has a black square in it. The other two are inconsistent with that measurement outcome. And so I remove those. And so the final state in the second scenario looks like this, white circle, black square. Um, this is a bit more about the minus sign. 
I don't want to get into that at this point. Um, so an, a final important thing about how to use the formalism is how we pass mists through boxes. After all, that's basically what quantum computers are all about, creating these mists and then passing them through these quantum logic operations to do interesting algorithms and things like that. So here's a, an example of a, of a Hadamard box where I'm inputting a mist. And the way this works is that I just go through the mist entry by entry and just use the rules for that box on those individual entries. So here, the first entry is a white circle. So I just take the white circle and I pass it through the Hadamard box. And then I, in the output, I write down what the output is for an input white shape. And that just gives me the equal superposition without the minus sign. And then I come back to my input and I move to the next entry, which here is a, a black circle. So then I input that into the Hadamard box. And then I add to my output the resulting state, which in this case is a superposition with the minus sign. That's from the basic rule of the Hadamard box. And so the total output for this uh, scenario is this big mist here. And then I can apply my mist rules to simplify this. So one rule is that I can erase inner mists which is what I've done in this step here. And then I can apply the rule where if I have two entries that are the same up to a minus sign, they cancel, leaving me with only the two whites. And now there's a rule that says if I have redundancy here, I can remove redundancies. Um, and that will leave me with a single white in this case. And so the answer is just a, a white circle. So I can systematically figure out what the output is given this input missed. So here's another example. All I'm doing is changing the input state a little bit by adding the minus sign here. And this works essentially the same way. So again, I will just go entry by entry, pass it through, and write it the resulting state in the, in the output, and just combine all of the outputs for each of the entries I had. The one difference in this case is I have this minus sign here. So the minus sign I have to also bring it along. And so it shows up in front of the output I get by inserting the black shape into the Hadamard gate, which is this mist here. And then again, I can apply my missed rules to simplify this down. And in this case, I find that the, the final result is just a single black circle. And this, can, this also generalizes to many qubits. For example, I can input a two qubit mist. And in this case, I must be inputting it into a two qubit box, or at least uh, enough boxes such that I have the same number of inputs as I have qubits. And so here, again, I will just take the first entry, which is white, white. The circle goes into the left, the square goes into the right, and I just write down the output. And in this case, if I input white, white into a C naught gate, since the square is white, the naught is not activated. And so the weight circle just passes through. And so this is the output um, contributed by this first entry in the input. And then I move to the next entry in the input, which is white circle, black square. Now, because the square is black, the C naught gate is activated. And so it changes the white circle into a black circle in the output. And so this is my final result for passing this two qubit mist um, through the C naught box. An interesting thing about this example is that the input state here was factorizable in the sense that I can bring out the white circle because it, is, it appears in each entry. And so I could rewrite this um, input mist like this. But if I look at the output, it's not possible anymore to separate out either the, the circle or the square since they, have, they both have different colors in each entry. So I can't factorize this one. And this is an example of what's called quantum entanglement. OK, so now let me just uh, pause one more time because there's any more general question about the formalism before I just briefly show you how the card game works. And then we'll go to breakout rooms to address more detailed questions. OK, so quantum circuits is a card game that's designed basically to let students sort of explore this idea of superposition in quantum mechanics and also how you perform logical operations, take an input state and produce an output state, which is, which is essentially how all computers work, whether classical or quantum. Um, so here, the, the idea is that we, we have um, students play the game uh, either one against one or two teams against each other. And they, each team will build up a circuit gradually. 
with the aim of trying to create a target secret state. So each team at the, at the beginning it randomly chooses a, a secret quantum state. And then they're trying to, from starting from some initial state, they're trying to build a circuit that realizes that state as the output. And the goal is to realize your secret quantum state before the other team does. Okay, so here is what the, the playing cards look like. So to get the game started, first, uh, an initial state is randomly chosen by the dealer. And we have four different possible initial states. So these are for two qubits. And the four possibilities are the two, or all four possible um, uh, bit strings, essentially, of two, two bits. So we have white, 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 black, black, white, or black, black. And then there are 14 possible secret states. So these are all two qubit states. And so if there are two teams playing this game, then one team will randomly choose one of these 14, and the other team will randomly choose one of the remaining 13 secret states. And so the two teams always have different secret states that they're trying to create. And now the, the basic playing cards are these five different uh, cards corresponding to five different uh, gates. There's a C not card, a two qubit operation. There's a swap card, a not gate, a Hadamard. And this one is the identity gate, meaning that don't, we don't do anything to this qubit that it's applied to. So the first two are two qubit gates and the remaining three are single qubit gates. And the, the game includes some number of each of these different types of cards. For example, there are eight C not gates uh, and eight swap cards. So now here are the rules of the game. It uh, looks like a lot of words, but actually it's very simple. So uh, all the words are there just to make every detail very clear, but we can, they essentially amount to this. Initially, you prepare the cards, so shuffle the cards and put them into four different stacks, one for in initial states, one for secret states, one for two qubit gates, one for single qubit gates. And then there's a dealer is chosen, and the dealer deals a certain number of cards to each player. And then the dealer also selects from one of the four possible initial states and lays that down uh, to get the game started. And then each player will select one of the secret state cards. So none of the other players know what the what the, each player's secret state card is. They have to keep that secret. And then, so the first three steps are just setting up the game. And then from step four is when the game starts. So starting from the a player who is not the dealer, that player has to lay down a gate card, or if they don't have anything that fits with the existing circuit, then they will draw a new gate card. And, and then, and it moves on to the next person. And then that keeps going until the game concludes when the circuit produces one of the secret states. And so somebody, one of the players has to recognize that the circuit that's in front of them creates their secret state and they have to declare that. Or they can notice that if they add one, one of the gates that they have in their card deck to the existing circuit and then realize their secret state, then they also win that way. So here's a quick example, and then I'll stop and we can move to breakout rooms. Um, so suppose we have two players, player one and player two, and they draw these two different secret states. So these are black, white, minus black, black for player one, and player two has white, white, and minus black, black. And now, um, so let's suppose, so player one is the dealer, so player one chooses one of the initial state cards. Um, Suppose they choose this one randomly, so they lay this down on the board, white, black. And now it's player's two turn, it's player two's turn. And player two has some number of gate cards and they get to choose what to play. And, but player two is trying to convert this initial state into their secret state, the white, white, minus black, black. And so here I'm just noting what the current state is given the circuit. So I haven't done anything yet. So the, so the current state is just white, black. And now player two can choose to lay down an identity card here. I suppose they do. And now it's again player one, player one's turn. And so player one chooses to lay down a Hadamard gate, which um, makes sense because if you look at player one state, it has two terms in this mist. And, and whereas here we have a single entry in the, in the mist. And so they need to create a mist, which means they need to use a Hadamard gate. So that's what player one does. 
And now the state at this point, so both players should be keeping track on their own what the current state is. And so if you apply this Hadamard gate to the second qubit, the square qubit, that takes the, this black square into white minus black using the basic rules of the Hadamard box. And so now the new mist is white, white minus white, black. And at this point, player two notices that if they put a C naught gate, assuming they have a C naught gate in their hand, then this will do the following. So since the, um, the state they have, the, the state they're trying to get is white, white minus black, black. If they do a C naught gate at this point, the white, white stays invariant. It doesn't change because I have a white box here and that does not activate the, the not gate. But for the second term at this point, I have a black square here. And so the, the C naught gate will be activated for the second entry. And so that will flip the color of the circle from white to black, giving exactly the secret state of player two. So this is why player two chooses to play this card at this point. And then player two writes, uh, puts down their secret card at this point to demonstrate that they have indeed created the state that they were trying to. And so at this point, player two declares victory and the game is over. So this is a, a simple example of how the, the game works. Um, are there any questions about it before we go to breakout rooms? Feel free to raise your hand or just put a question in the chat if you have one for Ed. Maybe also it's worth pointing out that the current state is not shown, something that the players find mm -hmm. on their own. Yeah, so here I'm writing it on the side. So here you can imagine that each player has a pen and paper and they're just keeping track on their own of what the current state is. But the, the only thing that's kind of shared between the two players is this, uh, the cards that have been laid down at this point. But these are only including the, uh, the gate cards that they have. 